Hello everybody, Jason Levine, The Gaming Machine here, and today I'm going to be looking at a interesting social deduction game. About two and a half years ago, when the pandemic first started, Tom had been running a lot of werewolf games, and one of the players said to me, Hey Jason, why don't you come and play this other social deduction game that I think you'll like? It's called Blood on the Clock Tower, as you can see here. And I went over and played a game of that on Zoom, similar to how we played our werewolf games at the time. I had no idea what this game was. All I know is I was told that everyone's going to have a role and you'll find it very interesting. So I got to play the game at the time and have played it many times since then. And now let me tell you a little bit about the game. So Blood on the Clock Tower is a social deduction game. There is one person who's the storyteller who will run the game for all of the players. You can play from seven players all the way up to 15 players. The basic script, which we're going to look at today, is called Trouble Brewing. In Trouble Brewing, the storyteller will then take the script and pull out characters. As you can see, we have a sheet of different characters, and each character has a different ability. As you can see, the washerwoman, the librarian, the investigator, the chef, etc. These, these top characters are called townsfolk. They usually have really good abilities that will help the good team try to figure out who the demon is so you could execute and vote out the demon during the day. Then there's a second set of characters called outsiders. These come into play at certain player counts. So in seven players, you would use five townsfolk, zero outsiders. But when you get to eight players, you'd add an outsider. When you get to nine, you'd add two. When you get to 10, you'd remove them and you'd add what are called minions, a second minion. So instead of one minion, you would have two minions in a 10 player game, all the way up to a 13 player game, and then would have three minions, zero outsiders. And of course you have one imp. So the minions kind of act as support team for the imp. They could die, it doesn't matter. If the imp dies, that will end the game and the good team will win. If the imp survives until the final two, then the imp will win the game. So the storyteller, let's say in a seven player game, would pull out five of these, one of these, and one of these. They would then take the characters, shuffle them up, throw them into the bag you get, and then everyone will pull out their characters out of the bag. So each player would pull out a character, they would know what character they are, and they'd put the character the storyteller then puts the character in the circle to match the way people are sitting. So you would have a nice little circle the, where the players can then sit and the storyteller will know which character is which and give them all abilities. In this case, as you can see, there are, there are night phases and day phases. So in the game, the first thing you have is a night phase. In the night phase, just like other social deduction games, the imp, and in this case, the minion, which is the poisoner, will learn who they are. The imp won't know that the minion is the poisoner. They'll just know that the person in that seat is the minion. They will have to then talk to them in the day phase. So that'll happen first is there's minion info. Then the demon will get info, and the demon gets something really cool, which is called bluffs. So we take a few of these characters, three of them to be specific, and these three are put aside for the demon specifically. And these three characters, the demon will then have because just like every good player has a character, the demon will be able to fake being a character. So the demon could fake being the monk or the librarian or the butler in this case. The demon can fake being a character, which will make it so the demon could blend in and not be obvious that they're a demon because they don't have ability. So you're able to fake your ability. When the demon's able to talk to the poisoner at a later point, not only will they find out that they're the poisoner, but they could also give the poisoner one of these bluff rolls. These bluff rolls are good for everyone to blend in. Now, of course, the good town or the good people will have rolls as well. So the investigator, they will learn one of two players is a minion, so they might learn that either the fortune teller or the poisoner is the poisoner. That's a lot of info to use. Of course, if the poisoner who goes earlier in the night order picks the investigator, the investigator might be told the washerwoman and the undertaker, one of them is the poisoner and get wrong info because one of the 
interesting things about this game is that not all the info is correct, and you're trying to figure out which one's correct, which one's not, to be able to solve the puzzle and figure out who the actual imp is and kill the imp. In addition, you then go down, watch room, learn info, librarian, investigator, chef, if they're in the game, etc., etc. Then, after the first night phase, you go to a day phase. In the day phase, the players now can talk. Unlike other social deduction games where all the players sit around together and talk, what's cool about this is players can walk off and talk on their own. So let's say the imp can run off with the poisoner, talk with them, say, I'm my bluffs are butler, librarian, monk. What are you? Oh, I'm the poisoner. I picked the person sitting in the washroom and seat, so they got bad info. And other players, the investigator could go up to the fortune teller and say, oh, I saw either you or the person in the poisoner seat is the poisoner. And then the fortune teller say, oh, no, no, I'm the fortune teller. Let's try to kill the poisoner. There's a few minutes of that, which is called the whisper phase, because not only can you talk to a bunch of people in town square, but you can pull people aside for private conversations, which gives you a chance to give info, but not either if you're good, you don't want the whole evil team to learn your info, or if you're evil, you want to make plans without the good team hearing it. After a whisper phase, then you get what's called the execution phase. And executions work a little differently than most social deduction games. In this game, what will happen with an execution phase is one player says, I would like to nominate another player. So the investigator might say, I would like to nominate the poisoner. Obviously, you're using names like me, Jason, would like to nominate Tom sitting here. Then what happens is the, the storyteller will sit, will allow first the investigator to give an accusation of why, and then allow the poisoner player to give a rebuttal of why not. And then starting from that player, the storyteller will go around. And if you have your hand up as they spin around and look at you, it will be a yes vote. If you have your hand down, it will be a no vote. If there are a majority of yes votes of the alive players, then you will be marked for execution. It doesn't mean you will die because, let's say the poisoner got four votes in this case, the poisoner could then nominate someone else. If someone else gets exactly four votes, then the vote ties and all the marks go away. If someone else would get five votes and get one more vote than the poisoner, then that person would instead be on the block. After each person gets at least one gets one chance to nominate, and each person only can be nominated once. So in order to determine who who is executed, you do that. Not everyone has to nominate. Not everyone will be nominated. The town will usually come to some sort of consensus. And when that happens, the person with the most votes at that point will be executed. They then get an execution marker. They are not out of the game. They are still part of the game. If they had a role that acts in every other night, like let's say they killed the fortune teller, the fortune teller would get no more info, but they're still in the game, they can still give out the info that they had, they can still share, people can still talk to them and give them secrets, etc., etc. In the second night, obviously roles, there's some roles that don't wake up in the first night, but then they wake up in future nights and get info in future nights. In addition, there are roles that never wake up, but have power, such as the mayor, who will never wake up, but if they're in the final three and there's no execution, good team wins, assuming they still have their power. So every single person in the game will have a role. And that's a very important part of this is to make sure that you know, unlike other social deduction games, everyone will have a role. Everyone will get to do something. They, even the evil team will get to fake being a role. And the catch is trying to go through a bunch of day phases, a executing people, a bunch of night phases, where at night the demon is killing someone, and then you get to eventually, when there's three players left, you're going to do one final vote, and when you do, obviously if the imp is killed, the good team will win. If the imp is not killed, then the imp will win because they're down to two players. If you're dead, you still get a vote. You don't get to vote every single round like the alive players, but when you're dead, you do get one more vote for the rest of the game. So a lot of players will hold off their vote and wait until the right opportunity to use that vote to make the vote worthwhile 
to hopefully, if you're good, get the demon, or if you're evil, to try to save the demon and protect them. That's the way the game works. Now let me tell you how I feel about it. So I really like Blood on the Clock Tower. I have played this game over these last two and a half years online probably over a thousand times. It's the kind of addicting game where you can play it again and again and again. Obviously, having the online presence is a great thing for this game. It reminds me in that way of games like Among Us or Town of Salem, but it's obviously a full-fledged board game. But I really enjoy that aspect of it. I find that unlike most board games, this is really a lifestyle type of game. It's a community-driven game. The online community has turned the game that wasn't out for a long time in print into a phenomenon online. And as well, I know when we've been at our Dice Tower conventions, our last one, this game was played left and right. It has taken over the place of Werewolf in nighttime gaming at conventions. It really, I noticed it not just at our convention, but at Gen Con and, and now I'm hearing as we're gonna be going to Essen, same thing that people wanna play this at night. It really has taken over the realm of social deduction. What I really enjoy about this the most, since you wanna know why I enjoy it so much, is there's a lot of things. First is there's a real puzzle. The fact that there's a puzzle and you're trying to solve the puzzle, whether or not you get true info, false info, whatever, you're actually trying to solve a puzzle and you're all trying to work together. Obviously, if you're evil, you're trying to make up pieces of that puzzle and you're trying to blend in and not make it too obvious that you're evil. But the good team is really trying to solve a puzzle. That puzzle solving aspect is one of the most unique elements of this game compared to other games. The fact that everyone has a role, even the evil team has fake roles that they could pretend to be, really leads towards a big, big logic puzzle. And logic puzzles are one of my favorite games. So to do a logic puzzle in a social deduction game and have the logic part come out and really shine is something that I think is incredible about this game. The next thing that I find incredible about this game is the whispering. So if you didn't know, if you haven't watched my top 100, um, Diplomacy is in my top 10 games of all time. I love games like that where you can plan and plot behind people's backs. So if you like planning, plotting, figuring out things, of course, also working together. Whenever you go off and talk to someone, it's not always a planning and plotting something evil. You could be good people just sharing information and trying to put together the puzzle. That's what's unique about this is you really work together. Yes, you're going to share information together like other social deduction games, but you could also privately share information. and certain people could work together and then reveal their information at a later point when it's beneficial to them because certain roles that collect information at all times don't want to get killed at night by the by the demon but other roles that might have only gotten info on the very first night and never again are okay dying so you have to kind of bluff to the evil team as well and act like you have an important role so they might kill you or act like you don't have an important role so they don't kill you the bluffing in this is some of the best bluffing i've seen in a social deduction game. What I also really like about this game is you have many scripts. So in the base game, you get the Trouble Brewing script, which is basically an introductory script. It plays similar to Werewolf. It has roles like um, a bodyguard and a seer, but they're, they're different. They have different styles. There's a monk and there is an empath and there's a fortune teller and they have different powers. Like the monk, you pick someone you could pick, and but you have to pick a different, no, you, have, you could pick actually uh, the same person every single night. Unlike, unlike the bodyguard in Werewolf with the Monk, you could actually pick the same person every night and keep protecting until you're killed. So you could keep protecting someone if you really want to make sure that they get their information. And then you have an empath who, they, get, they find out how many of their neighbors are evil. So they're kind of like a seer, but they only, they learn about both their neighbors. So if they find out one's evil, they're not sure which one, so it's not quite as powerful. And the fortune teller has a different power where they pick two people and they learn if either one of them's the demon. Of course, there are some other roles in the game, such as a recluse or a red herring, which is part of the fortune teller info that would give them a false yes. So just because you get a yes doesn't mean one of those two people is a demon, but it gives you info. 
Now, of course, all these roles, like I'm explaining, can be hit by a poisoner or be drunk. And if you're drunk, you actually think you're the role, but you're not. So you're thinking you're getting info and then you find out that your info is all wrong. And if you followed your info, you need to backtrack to try to figure out the puzzle. Trouble Brewing is, is a really good introductory script for people who like Werewolf or like other games such as The Resistance Avalon or um, Battlestar Galactica, games like that. Trouble Brewing would be the script to start with. You also have Sex and Violets. Sex and Violets is a different kind of script, and this script works on not just information, but now there's a lot more wrong information or a lot more right information, but there's also this new rule called Madness, where you now introduce people who have to are forced to be to say that they're a different character than they are. So if I'm one character, like the artist, I can't just say I'm the artist because if I'm mad by one of the evil characters who said you have to be the the seamstress, now I have to give seamstress info instead of artist info because if I don't, I could be executed for not following the madness. It's a very interesting script because it adds all these twists and turns and you're going to have a lot of people double double claiming so, you know, Someone might say, I'm the artist. I'm like, no, I'm the artist. And you're going to kind of have some conflict due to that. The third basic script that you get with this game is called Bad Moon Rising. In Bad Moon Rising, this script is very different than the others. There is a lot of different types of protection roles, and there's a lot of different types of ways that the demon can kill. Some demons can do multiple kills. A lot of roles will not die in the day. A lot of roles will not die at night. In this, in Bad Moon Rising, you're trying to figure out basically how the deaths are caused to figure out which demon it is. Because unlike Trouble Brewing, both Sex and Violets and Bad Moon Rising have four different demons, and you're trying to figure out not only who the demon is, but which demon it is to figure out where the demon is in the game. The, the very interesting thing about Blood on the Clock Tower that I find incredible is that they have an online tool to help you. This online tool not only does it let you mix and match, so yes, you get three basic ones here, but I could take some characters from each of the ones or this whole bag of extra Kickstarter characters that came with it, and we can mix and match, and we could add any 13 townsfolk, any four outsiders, any four minions, and any four demons, and you can make any script you want. You can say, I want to put this with this with this with this, and now I have an interesting script that has a lot of poisoning or an interesting script that has a lot of extra bluffing roles or a lot of informational heavy script or a protection heavy script and you can change what you want and you can meld your own script. They have an online tool at their website where you can go and pick the characters you want to put in and create your own scripts. So there is a lot of infinite replayability because you get not only the characters that come with each role but you get a whole pile of other characters and you can mix and match them, do whatever you want. I think it's incredible. I've seen so many different scripts. I've played so many scripts with my friends who we play on Zoom all the time, and I've played a lot of their scripts, and we played them at Dice Terracon as well. We just mixed in the different roles, and now you have a new script. I think that is also one of the great things about this game. And the, speaking of the online presence, what I found really cool is they've made a new online tool. There used to be an online tool where you had to use either Zoom or Discord and then play the game separately in a tool. Because the company saw the demand, well, also because it wasn't released for a long, long time, the company saw the demand of people playing online and decided to make a tool where they kind of combined what you, what you saw where you could put all the pieces together with the Zoom feature. So now you have little circles where you could see each other, you could talk to each other, you can break off into these little areas where you talk to each other separately, and a storyteller can run a game completely through their website, and you have full functionality of video, talking to each other, all of this. I find that the online community is just as good as the late night convention community, and I think that if you're looking to get into games and you're not able to find it because the first print run has run out and the second print run is supposed to come around end of October, beginning of November, somewhere there, so if you can't find the game, you can go online and you can play it there as well, which is a very, very easy way to get into this game. So, yeah, you ask, now you want to say, what do I think is not good, or what do I think that people will not enjoy about this game? Obviously, there is a lot of conflict. So if you don't like games with conflict, 
this isn't going to be your kind of game. If you don't want to have arguments over, no, my info says this, no, my info says that, and you're kind of pushing on someone's info versus someone else's info, or someone saying you, you're evil because of this, and if you're, you don't want to be told you're evil, then it wouldn't be the game for you. A lot of people don't like social deduction because of that. Me, that doesn't bother me at all, so I actually enjoy that kind of stuff. As you, as you heard, I like diplomacy, so I'm okay with that. I know, and this is important for those who play social deduction, whatever you do in a game, it happens in a game, but once you're out of the game, you all have to be friends in real life. I know they've said, Diplomacy Evans says it's the game that ruins friendships, but I think that you could, you could have conflict in a game, but then after the game, you could come out of it and smile and be friends, and that's one of the most important things when you play any kind of social deduction game where people are going to be lying, deceiving, and doing that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that, that to me is the, biggest, is the biggest negative. And of course, the box is so bulky. <laughs> the box is great. Um, these pieces are actually felt. And when you take the box cover, these pieces actually stick to it like that. And you can, act, and you can walk around. If you're, if you're the storyteller, you can walk around doing this. It's a great production. But on the other hand, it's really big and bulky to actually walk around with. So I give the production a very positive, but I give the bulkiness of the production a negative because a lot of people after playing it online are like, now I have this big 10 plus pound box that I have to carry around. That doesn't take away from the game because the game is incredible. It's in fact, as I would say, it's awesome. And I have to say, I never thought that I would like a social deduction game as much as I like this game. When I started playing it, the first couple of times I was a little confused. I was like, hmm, what's going on? Is this truth? Is this not truth? Can I follow along? But after you play one or two games and you start learning all the roles and what all the different roles do, then, you're, then you could really get into the flavor of the game and the feel of the game. And when you do, you're going to find in my opinion, the best social deduction game on the market at this time. This game is going to be the resistance killer, the werewolf killer all in one. This game is, for me, it's awesome. It, it's already in my top 100. It might be in my top 10 of all time at this point. I never thought I would say that, but as I've said, I've played over a thousand games online. I've probably played 20 to 30 games in person, and I find both experiences incredibly rewarding. I find the puzzle solving incredible, and I would like to give this a Dice Tower rating of 9. I think if you are looking for this type of game, this is the one that you want to get. Whether you get the actual copy of the game to bring it with your friends, or whether you can't find enough people in your town and you want to play online, you can find a place to play this and there is a great community for this game.